It, it's a lot like this. Four years ago, my daughter Ella was born. And in the hospital, the moment she came out and came into this world, she was Ashley's daughter and my daughter. And whether she wanted to or not, she was a younger sister to her older brother, Eli. Whether she wanted to or not, she's in the family now. This is how this works. And when we begin to understand this, what we see is that Jesus's family is intergenerational, where we actually invest into one another. You see, there's a lot of talk today about churches could only survive if they're multi-generational. And that's not necessarily the case. To be multi-generational is just to have different generations of people hanging out. But an intergenerational church is a church in which we actually see that we have value to offer from one generation to the next generation. Again, you are not just someone who has a gift to offer. You yourself are the gift to invest and to open yourself into as you give yourself to the local church. This is a kind of a cross-pollination that happens in church life. Notice Paul's instructions to Timothy again. This is from chapter five. He says, do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. You see, what is happening in our culture today is we are losing the ability to maintain a hard conversation in which we say what is true and hold on to honor. It's very hard for us to do this. Paul is saying this is possible in this family. You can do both. He goes on, treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Notice for Paul, as he's writing to Timothy, he assumes that these generations will in fact interact with each other and they have something to invest in. They have something to offer each other. And so let me just say something to the, the older generations here who are watching and a part of our church. Let, let's not just label the younger generation into categories of things that we disapprove of, but let's call them for who they actually are, our brothers and our sisters. They are your cousins. They're your nephews and nieces in the faith, nothing else. And the same for the younger generation. Let, let's not just stop the conversation at saying what the older generation got wrong and what we hope to get right. Let's call them who they actually are. There are spiritual mothers and fathers. There are brothers and sisters, and we should treat them as such in the family. I think of uh, something that's going to actually happen this weekend at uh, our home church campus, Palm Avenue. There's an 11 year old boy who's going to make the decision to get baptized. His name is Broen, and he got to share last week with his family that he wants to be baptized. And they, of course, they were excited to hear that he's going to take this next step in his journey with Jesus. But then he asked them this question. Is it possible to have my sandals kids volunteer in the pool with me? They were blown away by that. And so they're like, of course, yeah, let's, let's call them right now. So they, they call them up, they FaceTime them. And of course, this young boy, as he's asking this volunteer, he's just making this grown man cry. He can't believe it. He gets, he gets to be in the pool in this moment with his hands on this young boy, dunking him into the waters of baptism, pulling him out, declaring that the old has passed and his new life in Jesus is starting because he is a brother to this 11-year-old. Yes, on the outside, I mean, he's an older dude, doesn't have it all figured out. He's not just a random volunteer once a week. He is a brother who is investing into the life of this 11-year-old, so much so that he wants him in the pool with him. You guys, this is a picture of who we can be as a church family. This is the power of us. 